Him. Whoever believes in Him isn't judged. Whoever doesn't believe in Him is already judged because they don't believe in the name of God's only Son. So ends the reading of God's Holy Word. Well, I thought I was going to move back there and talk, but Arlene and Danny showed up. So, I will not be at arm's length <laughs> to make sure you hear me. I will stay up here. So, so thank you for coming. Uh, Brett put me to bed, changed his clock back at 8.30 last night, and told me to take my bath and get to bed so that we would be here on time today. And I figured it would be a small group, and it is, but I thank you for coming. So I have had a uh, really long week. Um, a young girl that I knew, not well, but I saw her a couple of times a week. Um, at 19 years old, passed away suddenly this week in a car accident. And... You know, that changes your perspective. Um, and we lost Guy this week. And he was 90 years old. What a blessing of a person he was. Uh, I always enjoyed him. Look forward to seeing him. And I know he'll be missed. And today I'm going to turn out to cry through the whole thing. <laughs> but if you'd like to join me, I would appreciate it. You crying. Um, but... The perspective of life is, is so different. Whether it's someone who was young that was taken or someone who was blessed with many years beyond what I can imagine at my age. And I had sat down to, to write the message. I actually knew about this, I think, um, at the beginning of this sermon series that I would come today and talk to you about recovery. And... Um, I had that message written um, pretty well, or at least I knew what I was going to talk about. And so, um, things that happened this week changed what I was going to talk to you about. And so, as I worked this week through the things that had happened and conversations I had with different people, I kept thinking a lot about perspective. and how things change depending on who or where is looking at what's going on. And it can be from their perspective, it can be from your perspective, but when it's in your perspective, I think we often think that's the right way, right? And then uh, there's God's perspective. And to find common ground and have a discussion and understand what's going on in the hearts of those around us, you have to come together and see each other's perspective. And in life, uh, that's very true. But it's also true that we're here to see things from God's perspective and to try to get to that point where we're open and willing to hear God's perspective. So today we are to focus on um, repenting and continue into the journey of of recovery. And I want to go back and remind you of what the last three Sundays have been in this sermon series leading up to this Sunday. The first Sunday, um, Jeff asked us to write down and, and share with a friend and talk about during the week and focus on um, what spiritual wilderness do we find ourselves in right now. And then the next week, we were to write down and think about where in our lives we needed God to intervene on our behalf um, and where he maybe had people already intervening for us to help us go where he just leads us to go. And then uh, last week was what one commandment, if you went over the Ten Commandments, do we struggle with or have struggled with in our lives that we need to focus on and keep working on as, as we move through life. And so this Sunday I invite you to gaze up at the cross and become aware of at least one spiritual habit or practice in your life that put Jesus up on that cross. 
And what ways are you working right now to free yourself from that habit that's controlling you? Uh, so now let's talk about the reading uh, that Brett did today. And I had in the bulletin from the beginning of uh, John chapter 3, um, I, I printed 1 through 18. So you kind of see where the, the story is starting from. And I'll be honest with you, probably the first scripture I ever memorized was John 3.16, right? And then I thought I was really intelligent when I realized that there was John 3.17 and knew what that was. But when I would read the book of John, I pretty much just skipped over and, oh, that's a good one. <laughs> 316, that makes you feel good. But I was thinking as I was preparing this, is, do we all know who John was? And um, you know what? He wasn't Matthew, Mark, Luke, those buddies, you know? He was John. And John came to this world for the specific purpose of introducing the rest of us to who Christ was. And in the book of John, he is telling the world very clearly exactly who Jesus was. And he goes through not everything that Jesus did in the time that he was on earth, but he went through the key things that he thought were really important. But the things that, that Christ did in that time that he ministered, it would have filled up many books. So if you haven't spent time in the book of John, I encourage you to go back and, and, at this time and during Easter and, and Lent to focus on that story and, and look at what the story is saying. And he was appointed uh, by God to be a messenger to us and prepare a way for Jesus. And there's a few things that we learn from John. And what that is is, is that God does not guarantee an easy or a safe life for those who choose to serve him. And we know that God didn't have a very favorable end. Doing what God's desire is, is the greatest possible life investment. And then standing up for the truth is more important than life itself. And I found those things, I keep encouraging you guys, if you don't have a study Bible, to go get a study Bible. But that's what my study Bible is telling me about John. So then let's take a look at chapter 3 and John. <clears throat> so this, this chapter, I never knew really where, for God to love the world, where that fell into um, the conversation in the Bible or where it came from. And it's actually a conversation, I don't know if you all know, and maybe I'm just the only one who didn't, that Jesus is having with Nicodemus. And Nicodemus, does anybody know who he is? Got a really cool name though, right? Uh, Nicodemus, he uh, was a Pharisee. And he was a member of the ruling council of the Sanhedrin. And um, the Pharisees were a group of religious leaders uh, that Jesus and John the Baptist they often criticize them about being a hypocrite. And most of the Pharisees were terribly jealous of Jesus. And they were constantly trying to undermine his authority because he was undermining their authority and their views and pointing out what the real truth was. In Nicodemus, he was a learned leader and he was a wealthy man of means. And he was searching for some answers and after Jesus has been in the temple and overturned the tables he's wondering how he can find some answers and so he is intelligent and he's learned but he decides that he needs to have an open uh, mind and an open heart to learn the truth about God and so Nicodemus goes personally um, in the middle of the night, he could have sent one of his assistants to go for him. But he goes there to find out what the truth is and to begin to separate in his life what's fact and what's rumor. 
and I'm sure he was scared to go because he wasn't going to, he didn't know how his friends, the other Pharisees, were going to feel about that, the person that they had been talking badly and, and, and discrediting, how they were going to feel about him being there to talk to Jesus. And so he goes and he talks to Jesus in the dark to try to find out who Jesus is. And so they start this conversation in John chapter 3. And it's about the Israelites who were wandering around in the desert and God has sent a plague of snakes to punish the people for their rebellious ways. And those who've been bitten and are doomed to death by the snake bite, they can be healed if they will obey God's commandment to look up at elevated bronze snake. And by believing that God will heal them, then they can be healed. Similarly, um, our salvation happens the same way when we look to Jesus. Believing that he can save us, this is how God has provided a way to heal us from sin's deadly bite. So that's what they're having a conversation about. In John 3.16, really, the entire gospel comes into focus in that verse. And lo God's love is not static or self-centered, but it reaches out and it draws others in. And in John 3.16, God sets a pattern for what he expects or what is to love. And the basis of all of love's relationships. When you love somebody dearly, you're willing to give freely to the point of self-sacrifice. God paid dearly with his life, with the son of his, or the life of his son. And that's the highest price that he could pay. And Jesus accepted our punishment for him. And he paid the price for our sins. And he offered us a new life by doing that. And he bought that new life for us with his own blood. And when we share the gospel with others, our love must be like Jesus' willingness to give up our own comfort and security so that others might join us in receiving God's love. And when we make a change and we shift perspective, when we're offered a new perspective like Moses offered the people by lifting up that snake in the desert, so too was the Son of Man lifted up. And it foreshadows Christ hanging on the cross. And if we're going to live for passion, for the passion of Christ, we have to shift our perspective from living today in this world, in this life, as though it's all we have, because that's what we typically do. We have to shift our perspective to an eternal life. Which means that we understand that this life is just an introduction to eternity. The threat of sin that runs through our lives is our own doing. One bad habit links itself to another one. And when we're willing to allow God to unsow our sinful lives, that's when we can start our journey into renewal. And so this week, my thoughts have gone in many directions and I, I wrote down a lot of stuff and I was thinking that we take for granted that tomorrow is ours. And we think that there will always be another day to do better. And we think that if we didn't complete what we needed to do today, it doesn't matter because we can do it tomorrow. And my question to myself and to you is, what if tomorrow never comes? And I can tell you for sure the only thing that I know about tomorrow is that God is already there. And I know I've told you that before. So step back and take a look at your life. And what do you need to change in your life to have a better relationship with God? What do you need to do today to create a life of passion for Christ? When we allow God to work in our lives, we move from a me-centered universe to what can I do for God-centered universe. Do you know what kind of power there is in living a life 
that's been woven together by Christ's desires for you versus a life woven together by your selfish desires? Trying to build a life on a foundation that is lacking Christ will lead you into a vicious cycle of wanting more, never having enough, always feeling empty, and always feeling alone. And that is exactly the kind of feeling that Satan wants you to live with. He wants us to get busy and get distracted by the things of this world so that we never realize how broken we are and that we can enter into recovery. So what are the habits and the thoughts that we're doing today to ourselves that put Jesus on the cross? Let's take a moment and remember why Jesus is on that cross. It wasn't for anything he did. It's because of all the sins of all of us in this room. All the sins that we did to ourselves, all the sins that we committed against each other. And I'm pretty sure if we wrote those all down, we'd be overwhelmed and they would suffer. It's a smother and make another person suffer. And the, the amount of pain that our sins here would cause. But then can you go on to imagine what kind of suffering and heavy weight that Jesus must have felt when he had the sins of the entire universe on him. The sins from the beginning of time until the end of the earth laying on him. So as you focus on the cross today, what are the things that are standing in your way of living a passion-filled life? When you step back and take a look at your life, are you happy with what you have accomplished? What if all the selfish things in your life were removed? What if you removed all the things that you own? What if you took away your house and your car and your clothes and your stuff? What if you looked at just the things that you're going to leave this world with when you go? Are you happy with how you spent your time here? If all you had were your memory of who you were and how you behaved here, if that's what you took with you when you left here, would you be happy with the life that you lived? Would you be good with who you were? Or are you not living the life that you want to live? But do you have these great dreams of what tomorrow is going to bring? Do you think it's okay because tomorrow will be there and I will get this stuff done? Or do you think, hey, when retirement comes, that's when I'm going to have time to live a spiritual life. I'm going to live an improved life and I'm going to do what God wants me to do. Is that the time that you think you're going to use to impact your life and others? Or is it when you've paid all the bills and you have everything you ever wanted, is that when you tell yourself that you'll begin to do God's will? When you've done all the things that were in your will and your want, is that when you'll be ready to start to listen to God and to do His will? In today's scripture, Jesus is referring to Moses and the Israelites as they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years. And I, when we were young in Sunday school, we started at the beginning of the Bible and we worked through it. And I really didn't like the Israelites. It was a long chapter. They did a lot of stuff. There was a lot of craziness. It was hard to believe the things that had happened. And I remember as a child thinking, 40 years is a really long time. And why can't these people get it together? I mean, I remember thinking in my head, Weren't any of them smart enough to figure out a way to get out of this desert? What if they just all started walking in one direction and maybe send a few people the other way? Couldn't they have figured a way to get out of this? And it upset me because I couldn't figure out why they were so foolish. I mean, God had told them, this is what you need to do. This is what I expect of you. And here's the promise that you behave and you do it. You will find the promised land. But they wanted self-gratification and 
satisfaction, I can't talk. Uh, they wanted to be satisfied now, how about that? And they wanted to live for now. And I was thinking about that as I read this week over and over, and I was thinking, 40 years, those fools, 40 years they wandered around, and then I got to thinking about it. How old am I? <laughs> I'm older than 40, and I've been wandering around in the wilderness doing the same kind of thing, being foolish. And so that puts things into perspective. It's thousands of years later, we're still talking about who they are and what they did. And we still want to be in charge of our own lives. We don't want God to give us the answers that we need. And we're only going to go to Him as a last resort when things aren't working out. That's usually when we turn to God. So what are you doing? What is the tap, tap, tapping on the nail that you're doing? into the cross. Probably not big sins, we're not in jail. And I'm going to guess that it's the little sins that we sow that connect our whole lives together, that's separating us from eternity and the love that Christ wants to offer us. And we need to be honest with ourselves about those things before we can enter into recovery. My question is, are you willing to take the first step to admit that your way is not a fulfilling one? What are the things that are standing in your way of a Christ-centered life, a life God would like you to live? So let's take a moment and watch a video, which I think does a beautiful job of showing how we connect these little choices together. You're not supposed to hide your words from our humanity, but that I want to answer. We sacrifice our heart in order to make the death. Then we sacrifice our love in order to get back to hell. We set future about what will happen in the future and we don't want to do it in the present. We don't want to do it in the present. We don't want to do it in the present. We don't want to do it in the present. We don't want to do it in the present. We don't want to do it in the present. And then you can say no to the resurrection of those that you want to work. And when you do something in the car, you still feel it. In order to get the joy of the need to put the clothes in the car and the homes that are easily ready to get you to the first living. You live in a world where they do the most common things that the many of our self and you need to set the process, set the process, set the process, and the process, and the process, and the process, and the process.
That video was Jay Shetty, and he has a digital morning show. A little background on him. Um, after college, he went to be a monk for three years, and then he has come back into the regular world and has a job again. But I thought that that was a good illustration of how we live our lives. Are you ready to recover from the life that you're currently living? And what is the first change you need to make? Don't be afraid to make a change because you're afraid that you might fail. Because I'm here to tell you, you probably will fail. The first time you try something, you may not succeed. But you will succeed if you keep trying and you invite God into your life to help you with the changes you want to make. For me, I'm going to work on not being so selfish and to remind myself that it isn't about me. I'm going to enjoy doing the little things that nobody sees me doing and hope that, hey, maybe someday people feel those things that I do as love, but I don't need to have a thank you now. But I hope that somehow I impact people and that someday the little stitches that I've made in life can impact others. So set down the things that keep you busy and cause you to lose the focus and the perspective of the cross. And remember that who's on that cross, that is the example you're to aspire to. It is not to be like another Christian you know. It is to be like God's only son. So take the journey to a better future and live for eternity. Step out of the wilderness and into Christ's arm of recovery. Set down the things of this world that stop you from living the life that God has planned for you. Life is too short to waste it on things that you think you need to do. And let's take a minute before we end to go back and to look at Nicodemus one more time. We don't know a lot about him, but he appeared in the Bible three times, and he appeared in John. What I can tell you from that meeting that he had with Christ, that he left there with a whole new perspective, with a whole new understanding of who God was, who Christ was, and who he was going to be. And the next time we see Nicodemus, he's part of the Jewish council, as the group is discussing ways to eliminate Jesus. And he raises the question of justice. And he reminds them that the law requires a person to be heard before being judged. And although his objections are overruled, he spoke up. He stood up and he had begun to change because he had let Jesus into his life. And then the last time that we see him in the Bible, is with another man named Joseph and they are part of the Sanhedrin and they have stood up and made a bold move and they have gone and they have asked for the body of Jesus that they could prepare it for burial. So he continued to grow and to change and those stories can be found in John. And what Nicodemus shows us is that God looks for us to have steady growth. Not instant perfection. And on this journey of change, the real question is, how well does your present level of spiritual growth match up with how long you have known Jesus? And I'll leave you with a final thought from Philippians 4. Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, Whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things. I pray that when we leave today, the words of our mouth and the meditations of our heart are breathing in God's sight. Amen. For the essence come up and serve the Lord.
pray with me the church breakthrough prayer that was inspired by Romans 8.28. God, help us discover new and bold ways to connect with our church family and the people in our community. God, give us the courage to see your call to serve in your world. God, open our hearts and hands to love and care for our church family and those in our community, just as you love and care for us unconditionally. Amen. Please remain standing and join me for the final song, From the Eye of the Storm.